Hello, I'm Peter Gallison. I'm the faculty director of the collection of historical scientific instruments here at Harvard. This is a collection that began in one sense in the 17th century as a Wunderkammer, a chamber of wonders, special, bizarre, strange, illustrative objects collected from around the world. Then in the 18th century, tragically, it burned down. When the collection was started again as a modern instrument collection, one of the chief initial collectors of these instruments, of electrical devices and optical devices and other things, was Benjamin Franklin, who, when he was in Paris and London, helping to establish the international relations of the United States, was also collecting instruments from the great instrument makers of Europe. And they became the foundational physical cabinet that was used for teaching and research here at Harvard. One of the things that's happened over the years is that the instruments that became part of the research efforts in physics and chemistry and related topics were brought into the collection as a way of storing them for use and eventually for safekeeping. There were also a great variety of instruments that were used for teaching. We have dozens and dozens of binary microscopes, for instance, different kinds of telescopes, all sorts of timekeeping devices from all around the world. And these form a kind of physical residue of the knowledge that was produced and disseminated at the university. What I'd like to do in the next few minutes is to look at three objects that in some ways illustrate the 18th, the 19th, and the 20th century history of this remarkable collection. We have about 20,000 objects in this collection, but without doubt, the most remarkable one of all, the most famous of all, is this 18th century grand orrery. It was finished in the 1770s by the Boston clockmaker Joseph Pope, and in it, you can see the planets and moons of the planets as they were known at the time, as they moved around the sun, turned by a set of elaborate gears inside the hole. You see around this lower shape three figures, Sir Isaac Newton, Benjamin Franklin, and Governor Bowden, then the governor of Massachusetts. These figurines were cast by a rather well-known figure, Paul Revere. And if you peer through the windows, you can see the mechanism itself. This was not a hidden, obscure, strange kind of mechanism that tried to imitate magic. This was a perfect enlightenment object, one that would convey the rationality of the universe. Just as God was the clockmaker of the universe, so we could make a model of that clockwork and actually see it turn as it drove the planets and moons along their course. Because so much of what scientists hoped for in the 18th century was embodied in this grand orrery, it's the perfect place to begin our tour through the collection. This is our second stop on this rapid fire tour of the collection. This clock was up at the observatory about a mile and a half from here on Garden Street, and it was set to the apparent position of the stars as they moved in the night sky. And from this clock, you can see these two screw mounts on the side to which cables could be attached that would go down the telegraph lines that were owned by Harvard to downtown Boston and then distributed out over all the train tracks that went all over the country and all over New England to set clocks in the stations along those paths. And from the stations then could be used to synchronize clocks in the villages that were there. Now why was it important to synchronize clocks along the stations of the train tracks. It was because many of these trains only had a single track, and trains would go in opposite directions. At a certain time, one would shunt off to the side so the other could pass. If the conductors had wrong times on their watches, they could actually crash and kill people, which in fact happened in the 19th century. So this was a life-saving device. It was also a matter of convenience, that is to say, if you were in a station, would you use the time of the station or would you use the time where the train began its trip? So in fact, the first time zones in the United States were set by the train station of origin and would be a time zone three feet wide and several thousand miles long. 
it mattered to coordinate time, and the competition was ferocious to be the university or observatory that would set those times. In fact, this debate over how to coordinate clocks down these train lines became so important that Albert Einstein, when he began his famous paper in 1905 introducing relativity to the world, he began by saying, what do we mean by coordinated clocks? What do we mean when a train arrives in a station in front of me and I say it got here at 7 o'clock? What do I mean if it arrived at a distant station that it arrived at 7 o'clock? How do I coordinate these clocks? And then in introducing the way of synchronizing these clocks, Albert Einstein transformed our modern sense of space, time, and simultaneity. Here we are at the third instrument I wanted to introduce today. This is the control panel of the Harvard cyclotron. Almost exactly as it stood the moment it was decommissioned in 2001. We couldn't, of course, save the cyclotron itself. Not only was it huge, filled with radioactive concrete and other toxic substances, but it was simply impossible to even imagine keeping a site that's so important for other purposes now in the biological sciences. But here we took the control panel. And in it, you can see a kind of material palimpsest of all the different epochs of physics at Harvard. The first cyclotron was built before World War II and was moved lock, stock, and barrel to Los Alamos to help make the atomic bomb. The government promised Harvard that after the hostilities ended that they'd rebuild a new and better cyclotron, and they did. This became the control panel for that apparatus. It was at the forefront of physics for a good long time. And it had its ups, extraordinary discoveries across many domains of nuclear and particle physics. And its downs, there was a huge explosion of a bubble chamber in 1965 that caused a fatality and several serious injuries. But here you can see switches and toggles and meters from the 1940s and 50s, oscilloscopes from the 60s and 70s, knickknacks that were used to cheer up the people that were working here. In fact, it's a kind of record of all the different technologies that went into running what was then high energy physics over a very long time. And when finally the cyclotron could no longer compete with much bigger instruments elsewhere, it became a crucial instrument for medical physics. Its proton beam could be focused down very finely to be able to treat, for instance, tumors of the eye or the brain without damaging healthy tissue nearby. So for a very long time, this was a crucial instrument in the scientific arsenal of Harvard. As we look towards the future of this collection, how we're going to think about these objects in a new context, we of course continue to acquire objects, especially instruments that are used in advanced scientific work here at the university. But it's also an opportunity to think about how a university will function with the collection and to put it to new uses. We constantly assemble teams of students, faculty, visitors, to think about each of our major changing exhibits. We did an interesting exhibit, for instance, on the history of the Rorschach test and how it emerged out of other forms of psychological testing and what roles it's played, the debates that have surrounded it. A very interesting show not long ago on the Turing test, this idea that Alan Turing had that if you could make a computer communicate with a human across a teletype, in a way that was indistinguishable for a human, that they were talking to a machine, not a person, well, then you would have achieved true artificial intelligence. We set up imitations of that imitation game, simulating the computers and programs of different epochs. And it was a tremendously exciting show. We even had a play written by Stephanie Dick, one of our graduate students here, who assembled the exchanges between people and machines and between Turing and his parents as a way of illustrating the complicated dynamics of communication. As we look towards the future, we'll have many other shows. We're planning one now on radio. We're thinking of others about radar and other things. It's very exciting to have this collection, these objects, that can be used not only to recall where Harvard has been in the past, but how to rethink the role of a museum, of material objects and knowledge as we look towards the future.